Hello, and welcome to today's Brookings panel on affirmative action and the future of college admissions. I'm Catherine Meyer. I'm a fellow in the Brown Center on Education Policy here at the Brookings Institution, and I'll be today's moderator, joined by three distinguished panelists, and together we'll be discussing two cases around affirmative action that the Supreme Court heard this term, as well as how we should think about the implications of their decision forthcoming this June in light of other trends in college admissions. As a run of the show, we'll start with some broad questions and then move into an audience Q&A section toward the end. We have some questions that were submitted by you all during re event registration, so thank you for that. If other questions come up as you're watching the panel, please email those in to events at brookings.edu, or you can use the hashtag Future of Admissions on Twitter, and we'll be pulling those in as well. To set the stage for today's discussion, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in two cases this October, Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina and Students for Fair Admissions versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College. At the core of both of these cases is whether institutions of higher education can use race as a factor in college admissions decisions, which had previously been ruled permissible in the 2003 case, Greta v. Bollinger. In the majority opinion of Gretter, former Justice Sandra Day O'Connor noted that the court expected that racial preferences will no longer be necessary within 25 years of the decision and that race conscious admissions must be limited in time. Justice Clarence Thomas went further in his partial concurrence, arguing that his interpretation of the opinion was that racial discrimination in higher education admissions will be illegal in 25 years. However, defendants in the two recent cases argued that the nation had not yet reached to the point where the level of diversity desired by institutions or by society at large on campuses would be attainable without direct consideration of race in the admissions process. We expect the Supreme Court to issue their decision uh, any day now, probably once we get into June, uh, and that decision will come at a time when a number of other admissions practices have come under close scrutiny as well. The ongoing Operation Varsity Blues cases has highlighted the lengths that certain advantaged families will go to to ensure admissions for their children to highly selective institutions. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, and social distancing rapidly accelerated the trend of colleges going test blind or test optional. Um, and the discussions around affirmative action have raised questions about uh, other policies such as legacy uh, preferences that really actively work against colleges' stated goals of equity. So today we'll consider all of these factors together and hopefully end with some policy recommendations and paths forwards for the pr practitioners in the audience today. Today I'll introduce our three panelists who are all experts on affirmative action, college admissions and education law, starting with Mitchell Chang, who is the Associate Vice Chancellor in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Professor of Higher Education and Organizational Change at the University of California, Los Angeles. Mitch, glad to have you here with us today. Next, we have Kara McClellan. She's the director of the Advocacy for Racial and Civil Justice Clinic, as well as Practice Associate Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. Welcome, Kara. Thank you. And then we have Kelly Slay, who's an Assistant Professor of Higher Education and Public Policy in the Department of Leadership, Policy, and Organizations at Vanderbilt University's Peabody College. Kelly, glad to have you here. Let's start with just the broad setting question, what is affirmative action? Uh, how has the policy evolved over time? You know, what does it mean for a college to engage in affirmative action in their admissions review processes? I think it's important to um, understand that affirmative action initially started in our hiring practices, so in work, in the workforce. Um, in the late 1960s, colleges around the country began considering race as a factor in their admissions practices, and these practices were implemented in part to address a long-standing history of racial discrimination, therefore providing opportunities to higher education for Black students who had historically been excluded from colleges and universities throughout the country. We began to see that affirmative action is challenged uh, with the Baki case in 1978, uh, in which the use of racial quotas uh, was ruled unconstitutional. 
And I'm skipping over some things. I'm sure Carol will probably jump in as the legal scholar on our panel. But what we've seen since then um, is that the courts have consistently ruled that race may be considered, along with many other factors in the admissions process, because it is a compelling interest. Uh, and that means that there are educational benefits associated with recruiting and enrolling a diverse student body on our college campuses. And so we have seen uh, uh, several race conscious uh, admissions cases since Baki, uh, the most recent, as you mentioned, uh, involving Harvard University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I think that what's at stake here is uh, the future of being able to use a race as one of many factors uh, in the admissions decisions of students. Um, yeah, go ahead, Kara. Oh, no, I was going to say that was a, that was an excellent summary. Um, the only thing I'll add is that we often get questions about um, why doesn't the Supreme Court consider things like history of segregation, ongoing inequality through K in K through 12 education, really the elephant in the room when we're talking about affirmative action. Um, and as, as Kelly just pointed out, um, we are in a world in which the Supreme Court's precedent really forecloses um, the conditions under which um, affirmative action satisfies what's called strict scrutiny um, mm -hmm. and the compelling interests in affirmative action, which the court has recognized to be pursuing the educational benefits that flow from diversity um, and not the remedial justification um, that I think many people often uh, assume would be the reason for um, continuing to have affirmative action. Yeah, I agree distinction. Yeah, and, and, and if I can, let me also add that race conscious admissions is actually applied in very limited ways due to three important factors. First, there are nine states, including my own, California, that have banned such practices for public institutions. Second, there are about 4,000 colleges and universities in the, in the U.S., and only a very small fraction of them receive more qualified applicants than they can admit. In other words, only a small number of highly selective, and I would actually call them hyper-selective colleges, consider race in admissions. And third, those that do use it and apply it to tip the scale in favor of highly qualified applicants from underrepresented groups in ways similar to favoring applicants with unique talents or skill sets and even uh, legacies. Um, and in fact, several studies have shown that being a legacy has an even stronger positive effect on your chances of being admitted than um, through the consideration of race. I think that's a really important point to make. We had an audience question asking, you know, how many colleges really engage in using affirmative action? I think, Mitch, to your point, it's it's a very small share of the overall higher education sector when we think about the, the total number of undergraduates in the country, for example. So we touched on this a little bit. Let's back up and look at the history of affirmative action. This obviously isn't the first time that the Supreme Court has heard a case on affirmative action. Um, maybe, Kara, you could take the lead at helping us understand what are the key legal questions at play in these two cases, um, and maybe how they're different from um, arguments that have been made in previous cases. Sure. So just to start with what the president currently holds, um, we mentioned already Baki. Later on, there was a case that's known as Gruder, and that case um, really outlines what the state of the law is today in terms of how race can, can be considered in higher education admissions. So the Supreme Court has told us that you can consider race as one of many factors in admissions, um, but the use of race has to be narrowly tailored. Um, and essentially what that means is that it is illegal to have quotas, um, but you can consider race as one of many factors. Um, it can't be the determining factor, um, and you can't have, um, it, it can't be the case that um, minority applicants are insulated from competition. That's how the court has talked about it. Um, so really, as Mitch said, what we're talking about is a very limited consideration of race as a plus factor once you're within 
um, the kind of subcategories of applicants who are highly qualified. Um, and in both of the cases that are currently before the Supreme Court, as, as well as previous cases, it's been clear in the record um, that all of the students who are admitted under affirmative action policies are, are qualified. They're already within the subset of some of the most highly competitive applicants um, and that the consideration of race um, is limited to, again, to pursue the educational benefits of diversity, um, which has to do with universities' mission of really ensuring that there is um, diversity in the classroom to bolster things like critical thinking, class discussion, um, really exposing students um, to differences and preparing them for the work environment after they graduate from college. So that's where the law stands. Um, but we have these two cases that are going before the Supreme Court now um, that have made two different sets of arguments. So to start with the Harvard case, um, this case was brought by Students for Fair Admissions. Um, and just to step back for a minute and make clear, what is Students for Fair Admissions? So it's an organization, it's the plaintiff in these two cases, um, and the founders of Students for Fair Admissions um, are essentially three people. Um, one is Abigail Fisher. Folks may recognize that name from Fisher v. Texas, which was the last case to go before the Supreme Court challenging race-conscious admissions. In that case, the court ultimately said uh, that considering race, again, as one of many factors to pursue the educational benefits of diversity, is constitutionally permissible. Um, it has to be narrowly tailored. The plaintiff in that case was Abigail Fisher. And after she lost in that case, um, she actually teamed up um, with a man named Ed Bloom, who is Ed Bloom. <laughs> Ed Bloom um, is a former stockbroker, and um, he is um, an advocate who has worked behind the scenes as one of the architects in several cases um, challenging race conscious admissions. Um, including Shelby County v. Holder, which is the case that gutted the Voting Rights Act. Um, so he, Abigail Fisher, and then a third person, who is Abigail Fisher's father, um, teamed up and together founded Students for Fair Admissions. Um, Students for Fair Admissions is an organization that claims that um, the consideration of race is discriminatory. And so they brought cases um, against Harvard, against UNC, that led to the two cases that are now before the Supreme Court. But they also challenged race conscious admissions at different universities across the country. Um, and in the Harvard case, they allege that the consideration of race in Harvard's admissions process is discriminatory against Asian American applicants. Um, and they claim that they have members within Students for Fair Admissions um, who are Asian American and who are applicants to Harvard and who claim that they didn't get in because they were discriminated against um, based on race. Um, it's important to note that during trial, there were no Asian American students um, or alumni who came forward to testify that they were actually discriminated against. Um, and so we never heard um, from these members of Students for Fair Admissions that Abigail Fisher and Ed Bloom you know, claim the organization represents. Um, in addition to the, the claim of intentional discrimination that's at play um, in the Harvard case, they also um, bring claims saying essentially that the way that Harvard considers race isn't narrowly tailored or doesn't comply with the existing precedent. Um, and then lastly, they bring a claim challenging um, Grutter essentially and saying that the Supreme Court should overturn over 40 years of existing precedent, which would be a really remarkable um, and unusual step for the Supreme Court to take. The UNC case is slightly different um, in that there actually is no claim of intentional discrimination at play in the UNC case. So um, it is a challenge of the existing precedent and also um, claims that UNC does not um, use or consider race in ways that it complies with um, existing precedent. So those are essentially the differences between the two cases. The one other thing to point out is that um, Harvard is a private institution, and so the claim in that case is under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, whereas um, in the UNC case, because it's a state university, it's an equal protection claim. The analysis under both is, is very similar, almost the same, although the court has never said that it has to be exactly the same, um, mm -hmm. but the intentional discriminations are on different bases because of the private-public distinction.
Great. That was incredibly helpful. I just want to add one thing to what Kara said in in discussing the legal arguments for the plaintiffs, the arguments in favor of colleges that want to continue to use race conscious affirmative action is that diversity is important. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now amassed over 25 years of research from different fields, from education to business, mm -hmm. to health, to medicine that, that shows the importance of diversity um, as important to our colleges and universities and even beyond uh, our institutions. So when we prioritize diversity in college admissions, we improve the representation of students who are historically excluded on our campuses, um, but who could benefit uh, individually, they could benefit organizations that they are part of, they could benefit our society. Um, and so colleges are, um, are, their argument in favor of a race conscious admissions is because of what the, those policies are able to help those institutions do in terms of meeting their missions, in terms of preparing and educating a diverse citizenry that has benefits for all of us. Um, recognizing that diversity is not the silver bullet here, of course, um, that is one of the reasons why it has been upheld in these cases over the years. It's because colleges have been able to demonstrate um, that it is a compelling interest and that it can be achieved through these race conscious admissions policies. Yeah, I think that's a really important point to make. And, and you're right, Kelly. I mean, we have so much evidence, both descriptive evidence, randomized control trials, where you look at sort of small interactions in a diverse group, as opposed to sort of more macro studies of what the overall composition of an organization looks like. And sort of time and time again, the research really hammers home the benefits of diversity for all individuals. Yeah, and I'm glad you raised this because uh, this time around with these two cases, uh, diversity doesn't seem to be on trial here. I think even the uh, other side, uh, the plaintiffs, agree that the evidence uh, regarding the benefits, educational benefits of diversity, are pretty strong here. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, to just to add what uh, to what Kelly said here, um, institutions are also eager to defend um, race conscious admissions as an option for them because uh, they want to remain legitimate to society. And they know that uh, having uh, a diverse student body um, signals that not only for um, incoming students, um, because they they want to uh, have that experience that's very different from their uh, home environments, um, usually coming from segregated neighborhoods, and um, but also uh, to prepare um, students for what's next uh, in, in, in life. So, so um, I think it uh, helps them, helps institutions uh, signal uh, to the public that they, they are a legitimate preparation ground for future leaders. Um, so Kara, I had a question following up on some of the, the differences between Harvard and UNC and whether or not there was sort of this intentional discrimination claim, um, I am not a legal scholar, um, but I know what has been discussed a lot uh, in the other kind of big higher ed cases, the student loan cases has been the issue of standing and somebody having a sort of a, a, a cause for uh, bringing a case. How, how does that play out in these two cases? If particularly in the Harvard case, it seems like they're making a claim of standing, but no actual individual uh, is coming forward to state intentional harm. It's a really great question and I don't have a satisfactory answer, not because um, it didn't come up at trial, but because this is an area where um, we've seen over the years, federal courts have really relaxed the typical standing requirement um, mm -hmm. in ways that they don't do in other areas of law and in ways that have um, in the reverse discrimination cases really privileged white plaintiffs in a way that um, plaintiffs who are people of color often don't get that yeah. benefit of the doubt when it comes to standing and bringing discrimination cases. Um, but essentially, um, although I can speak, this is specifically an issue in the Harvard case where there is an intentional discrimination claim, um, Harvard challenged um, the standing of students for a fair admissions, you know, saying who is the injured individual um, that, that supports your 
um, standing in this case. Um, and although an individual wasn't identified by name or, or didn't testify um, during trial, and in fact, there wasn't an, even an individual application, despite thousands of applications um, being available on the record to both sides, um, that Students for Fair Admissions pointed to as an example of discrimination. Um, despite that, um, there, there was, uh, Students for Fair Admissions um, did offer um, redacted um, essentially affidavits saying that they had members who had applied um, to Harvard who were Asian American and if they had the opportunity would transfer um, to Harvard. Um, and so that was that was the basis um, for standing, although, you know, typically um, establishing that an individual is injured for standard for standing purposes is a more rigorous analysis. Right. Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. Um, all right, so nobody has a crystal ball. I'm not going to ask anybody to make a specific prediction of what you think the ruling is going to look like when it comes out in uh, a couple of weeks. But I would say most colleges and universities and experts are expecting that the court is going to rule in favor of the plaintiffs and there will be um, at least a severe limitation, if not outright ban on the consideration of race in college admissions. Uh, without sort of identifying what you think is the most likely option, what are the variations of a ruling that could come out in the next few weeks and how, what are sort of the meaningful differences in the way that the court could rule? So I'll, I'll take a, oh, Kelly, I'm sorry, I didn't see that you already. Please. No, no, I'll, you can go ahead. I was just going to say, I would love for the for affirmative action to be upheld. I mean, I think that's the best case scenario is that we are all surprised uh, yeah. in the next few weeks and uh, it is maintained as the law. But as you said, I think that there are a lot of signals that suggest that that might not be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure Kara can talk about what some of those things might look like. So I just want to emphasize um, Kelly's point that although although um, predictions are that the the court, based on um, the way this current um, composition of the Supreme Court has um, kind of disregarded precedent and stare decisis in other cases, already showed a willingness to do this. The common prediction um, is that the Supreme Court will overturn forty years of precedent and actually say that. It is no longer constitutional to consider race as one of many factors, but that even though it is, you know, being predicted by many looking at the Supreme Court today, that is still an unusual step to take, right? I just want to emphasize um, that for the Supreme Court um, to disregard precedent or even to grant cert on an issue that it has recently decided, right, as recently as Fisher v. Texas. Um, is, is a highly unusual step and is an extreme action for um, the court to take. Um, but it's likely that the Supreme Court will rule affirmative action to be unconstitutional. Um, it could be that there, we get a different decision um, under the equal protection analysis and um, the UNC case versus the Title VI case. Um, it could be you know, that we get a more limited decision um, that um, provides us more guidance on what is required for narrowly tailored, um, but it's also quite possible that the court um, will tell us that diversity is no longer a compelling interest for considering race because that's what the, um, the plaintiffs have asked the court to do is literally to overturn um, the existing precedent that says that it is a compelling interest. Um, one other thing I just wanted to emphasize, um, which you know, Mitch is right that um, diversity um, was not what the plaintiffs spent a lot of time um, saying is not a compelling interest, um, but it still is the case that um, that overturning precedent could lead to that outcome. And, and, and even more importantly, um, just from a practical standpoint, it's very much the case that saying that Grutter is no longer um, controlling law and that race can't be considered is going to lead to a severe reduction in the number of students of color on campus. That was very clear in, in the um, record of both cases. Um, in the Harvard case, um, the, the record that both sides acknowledged that was, was that without considering race, the number of Black and Latinx students on campus would reduce be reduced by around 50%. Um, and so the stakes of this case 
are huge in terms of what our institutions of higher education look like and in terms of the pipelines that higher education creates, um, that there would be a severe number, um, a, a, a severe reduction in the number of students of color on campuses, particularly Black, Latinx, um, Native American, um, and, and some groups of Asian American students as well. Yeah, I think that's a great transition, Mitch. Obviously, you're in California, which has for years banned the consideration of race and admissions. What do we know from what happened in California and other states when affirmative action has been banned? Yeah, we know this all too well. So, um, so I can make some predictions here. <laughs> uh, if the court were to prohibit the consideration of race, um, that my first prediction will be would be that uh, we would expect a what the courts call a meaningful reduction in the proportion of underrepresented students at highly selective institutions. That is exactly what we saw in California, especially with UCLA and UC Berkeley, we uh, both institutions saw uh, the African-American uh, undergraduate population drop by nearly half following the enactment of Proposition 209, which was the uh, ballot initiative passed in 1996 and went into effect in the 1998 emissions year at UCLA. Uh, according to some court testimonies, um, Harvard expects to see a 32% reduction in uh, African-American representation uh, if they were to lose their case. Now, it took um, UCLA nearly two decades um, to return to the numbers of what uh, we we had uh, with African-American students prior to Proposition 209. And uh, for the numbers of African-American male, we are now just barely above the numbers we were at in the mid-90s. Now, this slow recovery, um, e e even though it took so long, was, was actually a very deliberate process. And we, we had to uh, make some, some uh, new policy and emissions adjustments to do it. And, and um, if we, if you'd like, I can talk about that uh, later. But I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to other folks at this time. I'd like to just um, say that the effects are that we see in instances where affirmative action is banned is not just immediate. So certainly, you know, that there is, uh, you know, California. I think the the percentage of applicants dropped by fifty percent in the in the couple of years or two to three years after the ban was implemented, but sometimes it can be long lasting. I think Mitch's point about the the slow recovery is reflective of that. So in two thousand twenty one, uh, there was an article. I think it was um, New York Times, uh, I believe, uh, that reported there were two hundred and fifty eight black students that entered UC Berkeley's freshman class out of seven thousand. Two thousand twenty one, and at the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater, and the context that I've mostly focused on in my research on affirmative action, Black students made up about 4% of enrollment that same year. So at the University of Michigan and in the state of Michigan, affirmative action was banned in 2006 uh, through a voter, a statewide voter referendum. So you see that many years after these bans have been implemented, that there are still um, persistent uh, inequities in the enrollment of students of color across, you know, many different groups, including Black students, Native American students, Hispanic students, Pacific Islander, and other, and some other Southeast Asian groups. The other thing that I want to do is I want to complicate um, those numbers a bit by, by suggesting that when we see the low enrollment numbers, in places where affirmative action has been banned in the selective institutions. That is not only about students perhaps not being successful in the admissions process in the absence of race conscious affirmative action. It's also about students making choices about the types of institutions where they want to attend. And so some of the research that I've conducted and some of the research that I've seen 
uh, from scholars studying the California context suggests that students are deterred from applying, even though they might have the academic profiles that suggest they would be successful in the admissions process, they, de they decide to go to other institutions that they perceive to be more racially diverse and inclusive. Sometimes they go to institutions that um, are within the state, as in California, that may not be as selective. Uh, mm -hmm as UC Berkeley or UCLA, great schools, uh, but don't have as many resources. But those are schools where those students uh, shift to. And so this idea of the changes that we see in the representation of students on campuses um, in these post-affirmative action environments is a bit more complex than students perhaps not being successful because we're not thinking of race as one of many factors in admissions decisions. So I just wanna kind of foreground the, the agency and the perceptions that students have about the kind of environments that they want to uh, want to be a part of. Yeah. Kara? I was just gonna um, emphasize a, a subpoint within that, which is that um, we've, we've mentioned this in different ways, but it's not as if um, without the consideration of race, admissions process would be somehow fair and neutral, right? We've talked about legacy preferences, um, but they're all, all different kinds of other ways that the way colleges and universities conduct admissions um, disproportionately benefit white students and wealth students and disadvantage um, students of color and low-income students. Um, so when we think about even the use of um, standardized tests, which we have long known um, are most highly correlated with the background of students' parents um, and, and are both racially biased, but also um, that students who have highly educated parents or who come from wealthy backgrounds um, score higher on standardized tests. Um, there's many ways that the existing admission systems serve to disadvantage um, students of color and, and to privilege other students. Um, but it's also the case that um, without, if in a world in which affirmative action or race conscious admissions is unconstitutional, um, it's still the case, right, that, that universities consider um, other aspects of identity. So Students for Fair Admissions has not asked for an injunction um, preventing universities from considering religion, um, from considering um, sexual orientation, from considering gender, from considering many other aspects of identity, they are just focused on stopping universities from considering race, right? And so who does that disproportionately impact in terms of not being able to talk about the ways um, that race and ethnicity have impacted you and, and should inform and be considered as part of understanding your application, that is only going to have a disproportionate impact on students of color. Um, so I just wanted to complicate the idea that that somehow the existing status quo is, is fair and neutral because um, really the ways that privilege is based baked into admissions policies currently is only going to be exacerbated exacerbated if we can't consider um, the impact of, of that race has on applicants because um, we know that race continues to shape um, applicants K through 12 experience and can't just be ignored at the moment that they apply to college. Yeah, I think two points that really stuck with me there is sort of the weaponization of the word fair, I think, in, in discussions around admissions, because it, it's, to me, has always uh, felt like a very vague word that gets to be applied when uh, certain advocates want it to be applied in a certain way. Um, and this discussion around you know, race neutral alternatives. And I think any of us who do serious education research know that there is no such thing as a race neutral policy. There may be a policy that doesn't name race, but that doesn't mean it's race neutral. Um, certainly if you think about legacy admissions and the decades that white families have had to access higher education compared to black families that were barred from attending higher education admissions and there are simply you know, fewer generations um, from which to draw legacy admissions preferences. And, and, and uh, some of those analyses uh, were conducted uh, in, on record for um, the court decisions, uh, prior court decisions, and uh, UNC for, uh, in, 
particular, I, I was involved in some of that expert testimony uh, and I uh, saw, you know, some of the uh, analyses uh, by the plaintiffs and they they even acknowledge that there will be a um, reduction in the proportion of uh, of underrepresented students, especially uh, African Americans. And, um, and their their uh, prediction is that the reduction in their in their eyes is smaller than uh, the analyses conducted by like Carolyn Huxby and Bridget Long, who also submitted uh, testimony. Um, but they see this reduction as uh, relatively small and unmeaningful. I mean, what they came up with in one analysis was a uh, drop of 10%, even under uh, consideration of uh, SES or social economic status of, of the applicants. But uh, when I look at 10%, I think that I think that's a that's a, a significant reduction for a population of African Americans. That's already, already relatively small. And you multiply that over four years, and I think it's it's very significant and meaningful. So so um, um I, I I think um plaintiffs also acknowledge that there will be um a reduction. I, I think the difference is um, whether they consider it to be meaningful or not. Maybe this is a good time to transition because I think we've started raising some other admissions practices to think about other trends going on, things like trends in test optional admissions or as we've mentioned, sort of um, gained momentum opposing the use of legacy preferences in admissions. Um, Kelly, I know you've done a, a lot of work understanding how admissions officers make meaning of different shifts in policies. Um, what, are, what are important insights from that work and what are considerations that colleges should have top of mind to support admissions officers over the next summer, over the next few years, responding to changes in different admissions policies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's important to know that no admissions office anywhere will be caught off guard. Uh, every conversation that I have been a part of, every group uh, that is that I've uh, conference that I've attended, uh, admissions officers everywhere are thinking about the possible contingencies. What if affirmative action goes away? Uh, how do we prepare? And they are they are putting together strategies and thinking through uh, practices, learning from states like Michigan and California, where affirmative action uh, has been banned. So there's a lot of work that is already being done. A lot of conversations. Uh, the National Association of College Admissions uh, Professionals or NACAC College Admissions Counselors uh, have been involved in a lot of these. Um, trainings and conversations about what to expect and how admissions professionals can respond. Um, that being said, I do think that this shift will be will not be an easy one uh, for the small number of uh, institutions that do use race conscious affirmative action um, because they have to rethink the application process, uh, how to review applicants without considering race. I think the point that Kara was saying earlier about students have applicants having to discount uh, their racial identity or their experiences that may be racialized in the application process is really hard. So how do you do that? Um, and of course we do have some insights from other institutions, but it's still, uh, I think something that could be challenging. I would say that I think one of the larger issues um, and some of the conversations that I've had is one of uh, one is that is more personal and ethical, which is admissions professionals want to understand the whole of who applicants are. Uh, they want to hear their stories. They want to know what it is that they would bring to the college environment should they be admitted. Um, and so I think it kind of takes away from some of the work that they are excited about and motivated to do and the roles that they occupy. Um, and I would say that the other thing that that they are considering and that should certainly be uh, an important part of the conversation is how to communicate these policy changes, potential policy changes to key stakeholders. So to prospective students, to counselors, parents, others, how do they communicate what this policy might mean? One of the things that I've been learning in my research 
uh, on test optional admissions is that how we communicate to prospective students is really, really, really important. Um, so their work is not just about rethinking the review process, um, perhaps rethinking recruitment, but also um, knowing how to communicate that to prospective applicants. Um, the only other thing that I would add is that I think when we're having these conversations about the potential work and the impact of affirmative action in this ruling, is that we should think about and take an expansive view of admissions. So I study enrollment management of which admissions is one critical function, but the work of adapting uh, to a potentially post affirmative action environment is not only about how we review applications, it's also about how we recruit students, how we award financial aid, the policies that we put in place to allow students to you know, transfer to other institutions, our practices around credits and standard, Credits. So there's a lot that um, that is at stake here, and I think that this is an opportunity for admissions professionals and enrollment management professionals to think about reimagining um, what they do uh, in a lot of ways. I think that's a great. Go ahead and mention them. Well, I think we'll transition. Yeah, I just you know appreciate your comments there, Kelly, and and uh, that had a lot to do with. Uh, how we were able to make the slow recovery in the UCs, and um, and you know you get you, you can't take shortcuts anymore um, using um, test scores to to cut off uh, uh, make you know uh, uh, minimal cutoffs or uh, minimal achievement cutoffs or something like that. I mean uh, uh, institutions will have to begin to work a lot harder to uh, earn the enrollment of uh, a, a more diverse group uh, of students. And, and at UCLA, we called uh, that process um, of recruiting students intrusive recruitment because we we recognized um, after Prop 209 that we had to work harder to gain, uh, build lasting relationships and the trust of um, folks in communities that uh, hadn't had a lot of access to UCLA. And um, so uh, they we began with bringing in students from those communities to campus and um, going out to where they live to offer tutoring, college counseling, and fundraising to support their college aspirations. So, so those are just some of the things that um, we had to do. But the bottom line is, um, you know, uh, uh, taking shortcuts will no longer work and, and institutions will really need to work harder to, to earn the enrollment of those highly qualified um, underrepresented students. I think that's a great transition. We're starting to get a lot of questions coming in from the audience around these alternative practices that colleges can engage in. And I think we'd love to hear you all's thoughts on, you know, what are successful practices to um, sort of ameliorate the effects of an affirmative action ban. Um, but also, Kara, maybe particularly your perspective, which of those practices might be impacted by the ruling? You know, are there, for example, are there going to be any impacts of the ruling on uh, targeted scholarship programs, whether those are at universities or at foundations and thinking about that? Um, you know, specifically, we've had a couple of questions come in around um, you know, what are alternative metrics to use in admissions? We've had a lot of questions come in about uh, the use of class-based or, you know, wealth or income-driven affirmative action practices. Um, what do we know about sort of the potential of those policies to increase diversity on campus? So first, I'll just, um, on, on the first question, make clear that um, what's at issue in the Student for Fair Admissions cases that are before the Supreme Court is race conscious consciousness and not race neutrality. So there should not be a decision coming out of the court um, saying that some of the race neutral alternatives are unconstitutional. I think that would be going beyond um, what's currently before the Supreme Court. That doesn't mean that there won't be a future case challenging um, race neutral alternatives um, and arguing that they should be subject to strict scrutiny. In fact, Plaintiffs are already making those arguments in the K through 12 setting and in, and in other cases, um, but that's not that's not what's at issue in this case. And I think it would be an overreach um, for the court to, or, or or even from people for people to interpret a decision 
in these cases as saying um, that race neutral alternatives for creating diversity are um, are thrown into question by um, this case or are ruled unconstitutional by this case, which is explicitly about considering racial classifications, right? Um, in terms of um, how how we should think about some of the race neutral alternatives that have been and used in other settings already and their effectiveness, I, I should say, first of all, that folks who do admissions are going to be best positioned to answer that. But the one thing I'll, I'll say is that um, from these two cases and looking at the record in these cases, um, because the universities had to establish that race neutral alternative alternatives weren't going to be effective, we already know um, from the expert reports and what's in the record that, for example, um, relying more on financial aid is not a substitute for considering race. It, the universities wouldn't be able to achieve the same level of diversity um, by relying on a race neutral alternative like that. Um, because if that were the case, they wouldn't have been able to satisfy strict scrutiny. And in the district courts, they did, right? They they put on evidence and showed that they had considered race neutral alternatives and that they wouldn't be as effective. So we know that many of these things are not a substitute for actually considering race when it comes to creating racial diversity. But that doesn't mean that there's not, um, that there aren't promising practices that could foster racial diversity, even though they're not a complete substitute for considering race. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just say very briefly, um, you know, in some places, things like considering geography, which is closely um, often mapped onto race because of the reality of segregation in our country and socioeconomic status can, um, in a targeted way, um, ensure that there is greater racial diversity, um, but it has to be very targeted. Um, so, for example, we know um, that socioeconomic status is not a substitute, um, but that when you, and, and that's in part because um, socioeconomic status is not experienced in the same way by um, all racial groups. So for example, if you look at um, middle income black families and families of other backgrounds of the same income levels, um, those families have different experiences in terms of um, the neighborhoods that they have access to, the level of segregation in the schools serving um, their neighborhoods, um, the level of funding in the schools that their kids go to, even though they are families of the same income level, right? Um, and so SES isn't a complete substitute for a race in any way, um, but thinking about things like wealth and the, and the experiences of different racial groups um, and access to wealth and, and the ways that um, disparities play out um, is a way to, in a more targeted fashion, um, try to create racial diversity. Just like to add that when we think about the number of kind of practices that institutions have experimented with or have implemented, there are a number of things that that we've seen, including the use of targeted recruitment and outreach uh, efforts, such as those that Mitch talked about, getting into communities, partnering with organizations. Uh, building those relationships. We've also seen uh, the use of tuition-free uh, mm -hmm. programs and initiatives um, where in-state students who apply to and gain admission to a university are offered free tuition. Again, that focuses more on socio socioeconomic status, but one of the arguments is that that can also help to uh, restore some of the racial diversity. There's also uh, top 10 percentage plans and others where students who graduate at a certain level within their high school gain automatic admission to the institution. And then finally, we've seen an unprecedented expansion of test optional policies. Um, Test optional policies have been around for a while, but they were adopted by liberal arts institutions and private colleges. When the pandemic happened, a number of universities and colleges, public, Ivy League, all types, different locations, um, adapted test optional admissions. And when I say test, op test optional, I'm saying that as kind of an overarching term to include institutions that are test blind, test free, test flexible. The idea is that they're de-emphasizing tests, standardized tests um, in the admissions process because of the barriers uh, that those tests um, uh, presented for students during the admission, during the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. So removing those tests uh, uh, 
incentivize the students to apply. And so far we have seen small but positive effects on diversity, which is great. Um, and I think something that I, you know, if we have time I'll talk about later is, you know, that we need more research in this area, but certainly that could be um, a possibility. That being said, I do wanna say that the research is very uh, clear with simulation studies that have been done. Uh, Reardon in 2017 did simulation studies. Most recently, we've had some work done at the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce um, by Carnival and Leamy. And that work suggests that no policy, no socioeconomic status policy or class-based affirmative action will be as effective at helping to restore or even exceed levels of racial diversity that we had with the use of race conscious affirmative action. So we should be thinking about all of these alternative practices. We should be using them together because there's no silver bullet, but we also need to recognize that so far the research has suggested that race conscious affirmative action is still the best policy to help us to increase and restore levels of racial diversity. Well, I feel like I keep harping on legacy admissions, but I feel like the, the consensus is really that no college can in good faith engage in legacy preferences in a world in which affirmative action is banned if their stated goal is to increase equity and diversity in their student body. Um, let's, let's shift to, you know, Kelly, you kind of introduced some of the test optional trends. Um, what are some other interesting trends going on in college admissions? Um, I guess maybe we can touch a little bit on if we think test optional is going to persist as a policy and what are some other sort of shifts in, in the holistic review process? Apologize for the background noise. Um, I'm, I remain excited about test optional uh, emissions policies. That's something that I'm working on right now, but uh, there are also other uh, policies that are being explored right now, including direct admissions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is when students don't actually apply, they're directly admitted to a college or institution based on their profile. And so uh, there are a few states that uh, have piloted that or are piloting, piloting it, including mm -hmm. Idaho, um, I believe uh, Illinois and maybe Minnesota. Um, and so uh, we need to know more about that, but that could also be uh, a possibility for institutions who want to increase uh, access to their colleges without uh, making the application process uh, a barrier uh, or a deterrent for students. All right, I'm going to slide in one more audience question because I was fascinated and then we'll go to closing remarks. So we had a question about the role of AI in college admissions to kind of completely shift, um, which I think could play out on both the student and the admissions office side. Anybody want to uh, offer some thoughts on AI and chat GPT and, and such technology in the admission process? I'll go ahead, Kara. Oh, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I just know from um, from reading and, and seeing different examples that our algorithms are only as effective as the data we put into them. And so biased data is going to produce biased algorithms. And I think that's important um, to keep in mind as we're expanding our use of AI into new settings. I think that's a hugely important point. These are, these are created by people. Um, and so the design matters. All right. Well, this seems like a good time to wrap up with a kind of a final comment for everyone. I know we've talked about sort of areas where we need more research, but as kind of a closing comment, we want to go around. I'd love to hear you speak to either what you think is, you know, an area where we desperately need more research when it comes to kind of the future of college admissions, uh, or if you wanted to highlight a, a policy or a practice that you think is going to be really crucial to have colleges and states support in the coming years to advance these goals, diversity and equity and inclusion on college campuses. Uh, let's go, we'll go alphabetical order. I'll start with you, Mitch. Oh, thank you. I was hoping it would be a reverse order, uh, <laughs> but uh, but since uh, 
Uh, we've already touched upon this. Uh, let me start with uh, my my biggest concern, and and that is uh, that we will lean more into colorblind solutions or approaches. And as already noted by uh, Kara and Kelly, that the central problem with these approaches is um, to address at least racial disparities in educational access and opportunity is that we are invariably, we invariably end up seeing inequality through a perspective that continues to privilege whiteness. In other words, we end up upholding an understanding of racial inequality through a white gaze. That's like trying to address, in my mind, poverty by understanding economic disadvantage through the perspective of the wealthiest quartile of our nation's population. I mean, this approach simply will not capture the full spectrum of issues and lived experiences, and even with goodwill, uh, results in misguided solutions. We know th already know this because we tried it and been down that road. And historically, those subsequent solutions end up blaming the victims and attributing their condition to deficits in their culture, character, and upbringing. Colorblind solutions will always miss the mark. And history tells us that those solutions uh, make the uh, problem worse rather than better. Yeah, Kara, I think I, I think I've got an alphabet right. Um, so yeah, I, I want to um, echo Mitch's point, which I think is really important, and maybe relatedly, um, you know, I think the need um, for disaggregated and intersectional data is critical in the college admissions process. Um, I think that holistic admissions, although I, I would be the first to say that the way um, many universities are doing admissions currently is not perfect. I do think one of the benefits of holistic admissions um, is the ability to be intersectional in our thinking and, and to create diversity within diversity on campus. Um, and that that is incredibly important, but that um, we need to have data and um, rigorous data and disaggregated data to really um, look at the impact of different policies on different um, intersections of identity. Um, one of the things that was most compelling to me um, during the Harvard trial, and, and I should say um, that I represented students and alumni um, at Harvard in support of affirmative action during my time at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who represented um, 25 groups of student and alumni in that case. Um, and students testified um, repeatedly about how diversity had benefited them educationally, but in particular about how diversity within diversity matters. Mm -hmm. um, and we heard testimony um, uh, from students who talked about how having um, diversity within the Asian American community was important to them as well and um, could both combat stereotyping, um, but also combat tokenism on campus. Um, and, and this is true for um, African American students, for Latinx students, um, but I think it's it's really important um, that we have um, disaggregated data and that we're able to continue to consider all different aspects of, of students' identity. Um, and I, I think part of why this testimony was um, so impactful was because um, it showed in particular um, that the students who did testify during trial who were Asian American um, talked about how important their identity was to them and in their application process um, and how race conscious admissions benefited them in the, in the admissions process, but also as students on campus. All right, Kelly, get to go have our last say. I, I also want to echo the importance of disaggregated data. Um, earlier this year, uh, James Murphy at Education Reform Now coordinated a campaign to raise awareness around the need for uh, the Department of Education to expand its collection of admissions data uh, and to disaggregate by race and ethnicity for college applicants and admitted students. So right now, when we look at 
uh, IPES data, we know who was enrolled, but we also need to know who applies and who is admitted. I think that goes a long way in helping us to address uh, potential in inequities, inequalities, uh, blind spots uh, in, in the event that affirmative action uh, is banned. Even if it's not banned, we still need that information for many of the reasons that Mitch and Kara have already mentioned. Uh, so that is really important. The other thing that I, I want to say is that um, a lot of the discourse around affirmative action and college admissions focuses on selective institutions. And that is in part because, you know, the, the history of holistic review, the, the connection between uh, the 2003 cases and uh, holistic review processes at uh, our more selective institutions. Um, the reality, however, as we've, we've said earlier, is that the majority of students uh, get into the majority of institutions that they, they apply to. Um, so as we start to think about how to reimagine the future of college admissions, I also want us to begin to think about higher education as a whole. Uh, how can we shift and invest more resources into our community colleges, into our regional institutions, into other campuses that have a heavy lift? I mean, they educate the largest share of students, and they often educate students who come uh, having experience inequities in the K-12 education system. And so I want us to begin to think about uh, those institutions that are so vital to the higher education landscape and to the future of uh, of our you know education system and our country. So thinking about uh, the implications of affirmative action and the implications of college admissions as more than um, the set of institutions that we typically choose to focus on. Well, I cannot think of a better way to end our discussion than with that call for all of us. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to our viewers for joining, but thank you so much, Kelly, Kara, Mitch, for joining us today, as well as Catalina Navarro and our IT team and Elizabeth Gelman, our spring intern, who all helped make this event possible. Uh, if you'd like to attend more Brookings events, we have them almost every day. There's an event tab at the top of the page that you're viewing this on that you can subscribe to for more information. Uh, and this recording will be available immediately following the event. Thank you all again so much for joining us.